All right. Okay, so we'll start with um, refuge in bodhicitta. And so if you want to just take a minute and set your motivation. And if you know the prayer, you can say the prayer or else just connect with refuge in bodhicitta on your own. Sange chudam sogi chunam nai janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam ki rola benchi sange drupa sho sange chudam sogi chunam nai janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam ki Rola penje sange drupa sho sange churam sogi chonam la janchu badu dani gapsu chi dagi chanyan gi pe sonam ki rola penje sange drupa sho and just sitting with refuge in bodhicitta letting it connect So um, this particular teaching is um, on the surface is quite straightforward. It's just kind of this leads to this leads to this leads to this and that's how we cycle. And then from another perspective, you um, start digging more deeply into karma and realize how incredibly complex it is and how many um, countless causes and conditions come into just one moment, just one rebirth. Um, and so there's a, a surface level of understanding this teaching that's very straightforward and accessible. And even if you don't believe in past and future lives, you can be really thinking about your own habit patterns and what perpetuates the ones you don't like and what cuts them, um, as well as how to reinforce the ones you do like. And then if you wanna dig a bit more deeply into uh, karma, it's going to be a little bit like falling down a rabbit hole of complexity um, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting to look at karma. So first of all, the, the source, um, the source of this teaching, of course, is Buddha Shakyamuni, but the image, this wheel of life image, where you have the scary monster of Yama holding um, these 12 sections and then these um, five quadrants and then this tiny circle. This is actually um, was inspired during the time of the Buddha's life. This is one of the oldest um, Tanka images um, or oldest um, Buddhist teaching tools. So what happened was that during the Buddha's life, Shariputra and Modgalyana, two of his heart disciples, they had enough um, kind of magical abilities and clairvoyance that they were able to travel to all the different realms. They could go to the God realm, they could go to the animal realm, obviously, they could go to the hungry ghost realm, the hell realms, etc. They could travel everywhere. And so they had a really direct impression of the suffering of samsara and what each realm was like. And then when they taught people, um, it had the ring of truth and the kind of weight of experience. And so when Modgalyana and Shariputra taught about the six realms, people immediately developed renunciation, right? They were immediately like, oh my gosh, I, I'm so lucky to be a human being. I might not always be a human being. I must use this opportunity. And because they were such good teachers, people were inspired and immediately connected with the path and progressed very beautifully. And so the Buddha heard that Modgalyana and Shariputra had such a great effect when they were talking about the six realms, that it had such a powerful influence on the students, that he said, well, teachers like these two won't always be around, you know, they come and they go. So after they leave, we need to have something that also kind of really shows the state of affairs. 
So what I want you guys to do is to draw a picture that has these five quadrants and has these 12 outside pieces and the Buddha himself dictated this painting. So, um, so this image comes from the Buddha himself because he was inspired by what, what good teachers Shariputra and Modgalyana were. And he wanted to make sure that um, kind of the essence of their teachings and their ability to inspire people remained after they passed away. So that's the source of the image. It's from the Buddha himself. And it said that uh, during um, the Buddha's lifetime, King Indrayana um, saw this image, meditated on this image, and immediately developed realizations. So it was working already, um, even in the time of the Buddha. So it's, it's a kind of complex image initially. Some of you are very familiar with it and have seen it all the time. Some of you have never seen it but it's very common to find it at the doorway of a temple. And during the Buddha's life, he said, you know, put it on the gateway of the gatehouse, you know, put it right in front before you enter. And so what you want to do is to make sure that um, when you see the Wheel of Life image that you know its purpose. So the purpose initially is to develop strong renunciation, the determination to be free from samsara. Of course, we want to do that in order to become of benefit to all sentient beings. You know, that goes without saying, but the main thrust of the teaching is renunciation. So what you want to do is be looking at how samsara is dysfunctional. We want to become disgusted with samsara. We want to look at how we've been doing the same old thing from beginningless time. There's nothing new under the sun. Right? In one sense, every moment is fresh and new in terms of the details and the specifics. But on the other hand, we've done it all before. We'd, we have had every kind of job, highs and lows. We've had every kind of family, big and small. We've had every kind of romance, you know, epic and tragic, violence and peaceful, collaborative and dysfunctional. We've had every relationship there's ever been in every formation. We've had successful children and unsuccessful children. We've had any number of pets, right? We've had so many experiences that in a way to kind of keep going through the same old song and dance again and again, we're just gonna keep getting the same results, which are some happiness that is limited that we're not in control of, a lot of suffering that we're not in control of. We're just gonna keep experiencing the same old thing. So, uh, you know, sometimes if I'm um, seeking some sort of samsaric pleasure, right, like ice cream or something, and there's nothing wrong with ice cream per se, but say the craving is really coming up. I, I sometimes say to myself, you have been seeking and craving and eating ice cream from beginningless time, or at least since ice cream was invented. Yeah, it's not yet led to your awakening. <laughs> yeah, will it this time? <laughs> And then, of course, you know, my afflictions say, no, but it'll make you happy for 10 minutes. Come on. Right. And this is the problem is that we're so used to chasing the crumbs of happiness that we never really dig into the deep wellspring of happiness of a well-trained mind. You know, so it's not like seeking these small forms of happiness is bad or wrong or that we shouldn't. It's that we are doing it instead of right? Instead of going to the rich, deep happiness of a trained mind, of a mind free from cyclic existence, we're just kind of, you know, hanging out with the same old samsaric happiness, expecting better results, like finally I'll get samsara organized, and then samsara will work for me, and then I'll be happy. It's doomed to failure, right? Samsara is doomed to failure because there is just not enough stability. There's not enough ability to orchestrate all the conditions to function the way we want to. You could get everything organized with your finances. You could get your communication perfected with your coworkers. You could get your intimacy perfectly aligned with your partner and all of your pets and children are in good health. And can you make it locked down and stay that way? Imagine you could get everything together, right? And then done, hold still. Life isn't like that, right? Life isn't like that. And yet there's this feeling that we have in the background as if we could get it all together. 
Yeah, because we get close, don't we? We get close to a day where it feels like things might be coming together, coming into balance. We have some feeling of like domestic bliss, you know, when people are getting along and there's love and there's this beautiful richness and there's art and there's music. And it feels like maybe samsaric happiness is achievable. Maybe I could keep it forever. This day is good. You know, you get, get days like that where you say, yeah, samsara is not so bad. If I keep having days like this, no worries. Yeah, forgetting that, you know, in the next moment you could have a brain aneurysm, you know, you could have a stroke. In the next moment, you could hear someone you love has passed away, right? In the next moment, there could be an earthquake or a bomb or a virus, right? So samsara is not really reliable. That's the conclusion we want to come to. And it should be a happy disillusionment because that means that so much of the work that we're doing, we don't have to worry about anymore. Yeah, so much of, of the way we strive and strive and our ambitions, all of that effort, all of that stress, actually we could let it go and direct our attention to other things, to the spiritual path. And that will lead to more and more happiness. So in a way, disillusionment with samsara is a joyful thing. It's a joyful thing to think, actually, I don't have to keep trying to reinvent the wheel. The wheel is fully invented and it doesn't work in this context, right? You can just kind of let it go a bit and say, do you know what? What if no one ever respects me? Well, that means I've got more time. <laughs> I've got fewer responsibilities and less pressure. Isn't that wonderful? You think, what if no one ever um, uh, sees my potential and shines a light on me and tells me that I'm amazing? More time to work. Yeah. What if people don't think that I'm beautiful? What if people don't think that I'm smart? What if, what if? All the eight worldly concerns, right? Going between um, trying to get comfortable, trying to get respected, trying to get loved, all of these trying to, trying to, trying to. It's exhausting. Yeah, it's exhausting. And what we're really chasing is happiness. But in that chase, we're, uh, happiness is eluding us. So if you stop the chase, suddenly all this energy opens up to you where you're able to really go more deeply and touch your own sources of happiness rather than the crumbs of happiness. You go to these deep, substantial causes. So people ask a lot, what is self-compassion? Yeah, people ask this question a lot. What is self-compassion? How do I practice self-compassion? And what they really mean is, do I have permission to go to the spa? Do I have permission to have a holiday? Can I please just have a really long nap and a bath? Of course you can, but that is not self-compassion. That's kind of, you know, it's, it's using samsara to soothe yourself about samsara, which is completely normal and, you know, sometimes is quite necessary but it's not self-compassion. It's just kind of like taking a bit of a break from the intensity of samsara. Yeah, it's not getting you out of samsara. So first you think, what is compassion? Compassion is the wish to be free from suffering for yourself and others. So what is the cause of the suffering? What is the cause of the suffering? It's karma, disturbing emotions, mainly disturbing emotions. <laughs> right? For us, looking at the real time, how do we work? Disturbing emotions are why we suffer. So the nicest thing you can do for yourself is to train yourself out of disturbing emotions. Yeah, the most compassionate thing you can do for yourself is to purify your negative karma. That's self-compassion, right? That is really giving yourself a gift of relief. Yeah, the gift of relief. So, um, we don't have to feel bad about all these kind of frivolous things we do to soften the edges of the pain of life. Yeah, you know, all of our snack projects, right? All of our entertainment projects. We don't have to feel terrible about them, but just don't give them the power that they kind of seem to pull. Don't, don't give them more credit than they deserve. Because also that means that your joy of them is going to be less. If you plan a vacation for a whole year and you save up and you build it up in your mind and when you finally go on this holiday, your expectations sometimes ruin the fun of the holiday. 
Yeah. Whereas if you're like, okay, I'm saving up, I'm building up, this is going to be great, but I don't really know everything that's going to happen. Let's just see. Let's just go with the flow. If my plans of the holiday don't work out, let me be flexible to shift. When you go into the holiday with a more openness, you might have quite an enjoyable holiday. But have you ever ruined your own fun by building it up with expectations? Yeah, it happens all the time. So even samsaric happiness, we can't, we don't access in an, as full and in as rich a way as we could. Even samsaric happiness we ruin for ourselves because we suffocate it with our expectations. Yeah. So um, attachment's a problem. Attachment comes from ignorance, right? <laughs> That's a summary of the day. Yeah, attachment's a problem. Attachment comes from ignorance. So if we look at the, um, at the chart now, um, and just what we're gonna do in this session is just get used to the image and kind of name the pieces. And then the rest of the day, we're gonna flush them out and see basically how to overcome each one and where the weak spots in the wheel are. Cause that's what we really wanna look for is how to um, break up the momentum of these negative habits. Um, so before we go into the image, um, do you have any questions or comments? Okay, so we're looking at the chart. And so your wheel of life, um, what you've got first and foremost is big scary monster, right? The big scary monster, who is Yama, who is like the um, mythical source of all evil or representation of all that is bad, right? And um, we have Yama of different levels. Um, the outer Yama is like death basically, right? The fact that death is out of our control. We don't want to die, and yet we do die. We don't want our friends and family to die, and yet they will die. So the outer yama is like uncontrolled death. Um, the inner yama is like uh, karma and disturbing emotions. And then the secret yama is like the very subtle imprints or latencies of that negative karma. So there's kind of three levels of yama. But in general, um, you could say that he is impermanence and his arms are karma and disturbing emotions. And that's what's got you locked in the wheel. Does that make sense? So uncontrolled change because of karma and disturbing emotions. That's what's, you know, what basically we're gripped by. So Yama is your negative states of mind and their results, right? Yama is not an external figure but um, he's depicted in this way to kind of show how very um, yucky, unfortunate, frightening it is to have life after life out of our control. Yeah, and the fact that we hurt ourselves and we hurt others is, is actually a big scary monster of our life. And it's okay to look at it that way because it makes us disillusioned with it. You know, if it was a cute little kitten, like I've just got you gently, but I'm very cute. You know, it's got a different effect. Yeah. So um, his three eyes um, represent the three times. He, um, so he's right now holding the past, present, and future in his clutches. Past, present, and future. And his five skull crown represents the five main afflictions. So the five main afflictions, you know, um, the classics, anger, attachment, and so forth. And he has four fangs, um, only two of them are visible and they represent the four Maras. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, that's just kind of a very rough Yama conversation. But what we're really trying to think is that, is it a problem that death is out of my control? Doesn't even occur to us that it could be otherwise, right? It doesn't even occur to us that we could be in control of our own life and death. It doesn't even occur to us that the fact that we get sick and the fact that we age is something that um, we could have control over. We're just so used to it being out of our control. These are interesting thoughts, isn't it? It doesn't even occur to us, right, maybe I don't have to have uncontrolled birth, uncontrolled sickness, uncontrolled aging, and uncontrolled death. What if that wasn't just a fact of life? 
Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, wouldn't it be wonderful if I had control over those things? And the fact that I've already experienced them countless times could just act as fuel for my compassion and my ability to connect with others. Yeah, I could use my memory of having done that countless times in order to relate and connect, but what if I didn't have to do that anymore? Yeah, what if I got out of the clutches of this monster? Yeah, is it possible? Does everything that we experience, every effect, every result, does everything have a cause? Yeah? Or do things magically come out of nowhere with no reason, spontaneously? If things have a cause, then we can end those causes and then not experience the result. Right? If things just come magically out of nowhere or um, some divine being is giving them to us as a punishment or as a lesson or as a whatever, then okay, too bad, birth, old age, sickness and death. That's too bad and that's a sad story. But more logical is to think everything relies on cause and effect. Every effect has a cause. If I eliminate the cause, I'll eliminate the effect. Yeah, so the cause of birth, old age, sickness, and death is ignorance, right? Okay, so we'll dig more into that, but that's the first link. So the first link is um, we're looking at the outer ring right now. <clears throat> so the outer ring starts kind of um, a little after 12 o'clock, right, if it was a clock, and it's a person with a stick. And this person is um, supposed to be a blind person, which is, of course, um, a socially unacceptable um, example nowadays, um, because, of course, it's not like blind people are ignorant. They just can't see. But what um, the image is referring to is the blindness of ignorance. So there's a few ways of talking about this ignorance. Some schools of thought, like Dharmakirti, would say that this ignorance is a misapprehension. Yeah, a knowing wrongly. Um, Asanga and Vasubandhu would say that this ignorance is just a more passive not knowing. Rather than a knowing wrongly, it's, it would just be a passive not knowing, a confusion. Yeah, but both of them agree, or both schools of thought agree, that um, the antidote is wisdom. Okay, so when we're talking, um, I think it's, it's more useful to talk about Dharmakirti his view is that it's the misapprehension of self, or basically the idea that your own self, there's the conventional I that does exist conventionally, which is merely labeled on the collection of aggregates. The ignorance says there's more, right? The ignorance that says there's more is the root of samsara. And this is the ignorance or the blindness that we want to overcome. Does it make sense? So when we're talking about ignorance, you could talk about lots of kinds of ignorance. Ignorance about cause and effect, ignorance about reality in general, um, but the main ignorance that's the problem is the ignorance about how the self exists and then everything else that's afflicted in our life stems from that. If we didn't have this problematic way of seeing ourself, then we wouldn't feel like there's friends and enemies or helpers and harmers and then have attachment and aversion because of those labels we created. Life would be a lot more peaceful if we saw ourselves clearly. There wouldn't be the same push and pull agitation. Right? So that's the first one is this ignorance, um, which is depicted by a blind person. And because we are blind about how we exist, we're also blind about cause and effect, which leads us to create karma. So the second section of the wheel is um, a person making pots. He's a potter. And um, there's a, pots of different sizes showing that the karmic um, seeds that we leave on our mental continuum are of different weights. Yeah, they're of different levels of significance. Um, <clears throat> if you're walking from your doorway to the car and you accidentally step on an ant and don't even realize it, that's a very small karma of killing. If you see an ant, want to kill it, stamp on it, and are happy about it, it's a much heavier karma. Yeah, so the, the pots are of different sizes indicating that karmic weight is different, action to action, depending on how intentional it is, depending on how strong the delusion that drove it is, 
depending on whether you completed it or not, etc. Right. So, so don't think that um, uh, if the action is identical, that the karma is identical, because it depends on so much more that's going on internally in terms of motivation. Right. The accidental killing of an ant or the intentional killing of an ant are both killing ants, aren't they? But they're not of the same weight because of the motivation. So karmic formations is a direct result of ignorance. And when you create karmic formations, that plants a seed on your consciousness, which is the third link. So the consciousness that's described here, some of you have studied minds and mental factors, and you know that there are six consciousnesses, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, etc. The consciousness that's referred to here is the main mental consciousness, right? The primary consciousness. Yeah, the mental one. Okay, so on this primary mental consciousness, this is what carries the karmic seeds. Okay, so where do the karmic seeds go? Life to life, they travel together with your primary mental consciousness. Yeah, so it's like your mental consciousness is like a river and it's able to carry many seeds with it life to life. And as the river goes from one country to another, it might get a new name, but it's still got this continuity and it's still carrying things, no matter what you call it. That sort of helps in terms of imagery. Yeah. Um, questions so far about those three? It's making sense. I know I'm going quickly, but we're just getting used to the picture and then we'll go back over them again. Yeah, clear enough. I thought what was um, carrying the, the karmic um, imprints, imprints are the subtle clear light mind, is the subtle clear light mind and not the primary consciousness. So I'm confused about that. Um, you're, you're quite right. Um, it, the primary mental consciousness, um, in, it, it depends if you're talking the sutra presentation or the tantra presentation. And in Tibetan Buddhism, even though not everyone practices tantra, when we talk about the mind, we go to the tantric presentation because it's a bit And the tantric presentation talks about the clear light mind, which is the most subtle mind, which only is, is uh, manifest to us at the time of death, or if we're a very good meditator or, you know, sneezing, etc. So that very um, fundamental clear light mind is what carries the karmic seeds. This is what carries karmic seeds. But when we're talking from a sutra presentation, you can say the primary mental consciousness, and it's loosely referring to the same thing. Yeah, loosely referring to the same thing, but it's easy to get confused because in Tibetan Buddhism, um, the tantric presentation of the mind is the clearest. And so we use it even when we're talking about sutra. Yeah, because we're not talking about all the secret squirrel business of um, tantra. We're just talking about mind bits. It's quite interesting. Um, and, you know, because of you, the karmic seeds traveling on the mental consciousness, there are, of course, the imprints of those as well. So if you were to get rid of all the karmic seeds through meditating on emptiness and then going onto the path of meditation and gradually removing more and more, you would still have the imprints of those until you're a Buddha, which is basically the tendency or the habit of seeing the appearance of true existence, even though you don't believe it anymore because of having destroyed the seeds and having realized emptiness directly. So um, the seeds are traveling on the consciousness and then um, the consciousness is able to um, kind of blossom into the name and form is talking about the five aggregates or the ship with the people in the picture, the ship with the people which um, leads to the six sources. So the baby now growing in the womb develops the six sources, 
which are um, eye, ear, nose, tongue, etc., which are those very subtle form that consciousness enters into, and then um, the physical organ is able to operate. So when there's um, the eye sense consciousness, the eye sense source or sense power, and the eyeball, then there is sight when it meets with form. Right, so you need all those four things to be able to kind of access form. So in this stage, it's just talking about the baby in the womb um, is developing the very subtle form that the consciousness is able to enter into. And then the coarse form of the organ is developing. Does that make sense? So the six sources are the empty house. So it's like the, the windows are there, but nobody's looking out of them yet. A bit like that, if that yeah, that's, so anyway, empty house. And then um, because of six sources, then there can be contact between outside and inside. Yeah, contact in this context means the contact between the quote inner world and the outer world. And the picture is sometimes um, a couple sitting together having a picnic. Sometimes it's a couple um, kissing and sometimes it's a couple in sexual union, depending on your tonka painter, right? <laughs> um, but basically, it's the meeting, right? So there's a meeting, that's why it's depicted as a couple. Yeah, the meeting of outside and inside. Does that make sense, that imagery? Um, and then because there is contact, immediately on the wave of contact is a feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And this is depicted as an arrow in the eye. Do you guys see that, that the arrow in the eye? And you think, gosh, that's so violent, right? We just went from sex to violence, like, God, Buddhists are so intense. Yeah, what is going on? But the arrow in the eye, I think, is a very um, important picture because could you ignore it if you had an arrow in your eye? Could you ignore an arrow in your eye? You couldn't, could you? Can we completely ignore our feelings? Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. We can't, right? And I think there's a lot of misunderstandings out there about Buddhism where people think that we become so detached or so um, disengaged from life that we don't feel anything and we become these like blank, neutral, beige people. Yeah, Some, there's a lot of misunderstandings out there, aren't there? Or that um, we don't have feelings or we pretend not to have feelings or we don't experience our feelings. There's a lot of misunderstandings about how a Buddhist approaches their own feelings. And right here in this teaching, it's saying, we're not pretending anything. Feelings are one of the most significant parts of our experience. We couldn't ignore them even if we wanted to. They're like an arrow in the eye. Yeah, does that, I mean, is that sort of reassuring in a way that you're not weird or bad Buddhist <laughs> because feelings are a big part of your experience, you know? But the thing is, is here is where we've got one of the, weak links in theory. The transition point between feeling and craving is our really key point of practice. You can feel any number of things and because of habit, you generate negative states of mind because of them. We're not used to thinking that the feeling and the negative state of mind are two separate mental events. So you can feel suffering and not have it lead to anger or depression. You can feel happiness and not have it lead to desire and attachment. You can just feel what you're feeling, which is the result of previous karma. But what we normally do is we mash them together as if they're one mental experience. My happiness and my attachment are one thing. My suffering and my anger are one thing. They arise together. No, they don't. They're mental moments. And there's a moment of choice there or a moment of truth where if your mind is focused enough, if you have enough mindfulness, you can catch it before it turns into an affliction. So some things are easier than others. And we already do this sometimes, right? Like um, if you're suffering from hunger, for example, but you're you know, a relatively disciplined person about food, you might be suffering from hunger go to your refrigerator and you could eat something quick and processed, or you could spend 10 minutes and make something healthy and good for you. Yes, this happens during the day, doesn't it? We have a moment of truth. Will we eat something quick and rubbish or will we eat something healthy that takes a minute to prepare? 
Yeah, I don't know about you, but this is a, a, a moment of truth in my day that happens several times, right? I will have a granola bar snack. Ha ha ha. Yep. And the, or no, I will have a proper steamed vegetables and quinoa and tofu properly, but it's going to take me 20 minutes. Right? But we already have this mental awareness of there's what I feel and there's the urgency that comes with the feeling, like I must do something about it. And then there's like the emotional maturity or the mindfulness you've developed that says, wait, before you make a decision that's not healthy, consider this, right? Consider this. And sometimes we think, all right, well, one bad snack in a day is not gonna kill me and it will give my blood sugar a boost and I'll be able to keep working for another few hours. I'll eat properly tonight at dinner. And as an adult, you can make choices like that and it's fine. But do you know that moment of truth where you could choose the unhealthy thing or the not healthy thing, or you could choose something really good for you, but there's a window where you can pick. Do you know this window? So this is like the window between feeling turning into craving. It's just that we're not used to allowing that window to reveal itself when we're having a conflict with another person or when we're feeling needy and want another person. We're not used to noticing the window of here's the feeling and then here's the response, right? And so that window, that, that window is our place of practice because the feelings themselves are an experience of positive, negative, and neutral, but they are not positive, negative, and neutral choices, right? They're coming from the past. So if you're feeling suffering, it doesn't mean that you are bad. It means that in the past, you created the cause for it, and here it is just manifesting, yeah? What you do with it creates your future, yeah? So if you want more of the same, you react with afflictions, and if you don't want more of the same, you react with mind training. Yeah, so that's the moment of truth. So what you're feeling becomes less, um, I don't know, less something to obsess about, less something to manipulate or um, have such an urgency or immediacy with. You think, I'm feeling what I'm feeling because of the past. Whatever happens, positive, negative, and neutral, I can take all of it on the path. And what's more, the seeds that I'm experiencing during the course of a day, they're probably very time limited. Yeah, how long do your moods last, for example? Or how long do your um, kind of physical discomforts last? Sometimes we have a background illness or of body or mind, right? Sometimes you have a background disease or a background mental illness that's sort of always in the background. But in the moment, how long does like a really climactic mood last? Right, not very long. Yeah, a couple hours. Like, can you be boiling mad? You know, shouting boiling mad for more than a day? You know, you might be mad about whatever it is for quite a long time, but can you stay in that really hyper agitated, red in the face, screaming state for very long, even if you're really mad? You know, similarly with like um, powerful desire or want, can you be like seeking and craving and seeking and craving and all full of whatever desires for that long, if you just sat with it, wouldn't it just finish? We, we feel this kind of like panic or urgency with strong feelings where we feel like we need to do something, right? But if you just watch them, they die a natural death every time. Every time they will die a natural death if you just sit and watch them. And sometimes it feels like a tidal wave coming at you but if you just hold your seat, it'll roll over and through and finish. Yeah. So it's different than feeling like you're blocking it because who can block a tidal wave? And it's different than sort of being like thrown back into it and swept along out to sea, which is what happens when you get like stuck in a mood for a whole day or a whole week where you're just in a grump, right? You're just grumpy for a whole week. This is what happens when a seed arises, you experience suffering, and then you believe it. Yeah, and because you believe it, you keep creating conditions for more seeds of a similar type to ripen one after the other, and you have this whole continuous ripening of negative seeds, and you're grumpy for a whole day, a whole week, a whole month, a whole life. 
right? <laughs> but they're, they're different seeds and there are windows where you can shift what kind of seeds are ripening. And one of the biggest conditions for what past seeds are ripening is your current state of mind. Yeah. So you can have a suffering state of mind, but be thinking about it in a good way. That seed finishes. And because you've been thinking about it in a good way, the next seed to ripen is going to be positive. Yeah. It's just hard for us to be patient. Yeah. Because there's this lag time, isn't there? There's a lag time between mental training and experiencing the positive results of it. Yeah, it takes time. And so if you can be patient with yourself, you'll experience the results within this day, never mind this life or lifetimes. It's just being patient enough to hold steady to the Dharma view or the wisdom view while you're experiencing something that feels dissonant with it. And this is very delicate because it's easy for us to lie to ourselves. You know, it's easy for us to say, I'm feeling this when you're feeling that. Yeah. So, you know, you don't want to jump the step of pretending that you're not suffering when you're suffering. Say, I'm suffering and I can use it. Yeah. Because what we don't want to do is what's called spiritual bypassing, which is where you jump over the feeling to the like proper mind training thing and pretend that you're not experiencing what you're experiencing because a good Buddhist shouldn't or something. We don't want to do that. Yeah. Becomes its own problem then after a while. Okay. No worries. All right. So, um, so from feeling, unfortunately, usually leads to craving. It doesn't have to, but it usually does. Um, the craving is a person drinking alcohol. Um, sometimes it's two people. One is offering and one is drinking. That's the picture. Yeah. And basically it's, um, it's that kind of hungry, I would like that, or I would like to be separated from that, depending on if the feeling you're experiencing before it is, is a pleasant one or an unpleasant one. So if you're experiencing a pleasant feeling, then the craving is for more. If you're experiencing an unpleasant feeling, the, the craving is to be separated from. Yeah. And craving then leads to grasping. Again, it doesn't have to, it just usually does. So there's another window where you can feel yourself going for it or pushing from it. And if you catch yourself, you can let it dissolve. But once craving turns into grasping, it's usually too hard to change and you need to kind of ride it out. It's not impossible, um, but it's a little bit like if you catch yourself in the right window, you can kind of head off a mood, but if you don't catch yourself, then it's, it's happened. You've got that mood and you can try and still be skillful and effective and a good communicator despite being in the mood, but it's like, you can't shake it until it wears off. Do you know those days, right? Where like you could feel the mood encroaching, you caught yourself and you averted disaster. And then there's other days where you felt the bad mood encroach, you didn't address it and now it's stuck in. And even if you try to talk yourself out of it, you can't, it's too late. Yeah, so there's kind of like two different scenarios that we get into in a normal day and it's very normal. But to remind yourself, there is, there is a little window there before craving turns into grasping. But once it's grasping, it's, it's probably too late for that round. And all you can do is to try and prevent damage <laughs> while you're in that state. So that is not the place to have conversations from, especially difficult conversations. That's not the place to write emails from, right? Or text messages or even emojis, right? Don't communicate when you're in this state. Or if you do, be very careful because wisdom is not driving. It's a bit like if you're drunk and you know you're drunk, don't drive, right? Okay, so grasping is depicted by this monkey grabbing fruit. Um, occasionally, it's a human picking fruit. It depends on the, again, on the artist. But um, it's basically like um, how monkeys are grabbing, 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 grabbing. If you've ever been to India or Nepal, they're so frenetic, right? They're really frenetic monkeys. And they, they're just like, I don't care what it is. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. I'll see if I like it. I'll see if it's healthy later but right now i just want it i want it i want it whatever it is 
you know, and uh, it could be the laundry, it could be a, an apple, it could be anything, but they're just like constantly grabby grabby and just like, you know, and then they'll fight with other monkeys about what they've got, even if what they've got they turn out not to want later, right? This is how we are. Yeah, so once grasping is engaged, wisdom is just out the window. Yeah, if you've ever seen monkey fights, they're so funny because sometimes the monkeys will be fighting over something. And then once the fight is over, they leave the thing that they fought about in the road and none of them wind up taking it, right? <laughs> it's like completely illogical, right? You know, one of the monkeys stole some socks off the washing line and now all the, all the other monkeys want the socks and they're fighting and they're scrapping and then they, you know, disperse and then the socks are left in the middle of the road. Yeah, so this is us, right, with grasping. It doesn't even make sense, right? This is how we are. Yeah, Elil is saying we're like that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so it's embarrassing, but good to know. Um, and then becoming or potential existence is the result of this grasping. So in terms of like a lifetime leading to another lifetime, this grasping is what waters the seed for the next life which is why this picture is usually a woman who's pregnant. Sometimes it's a couple copulating, right? Sometimes it's people that are making the baby. Sometimes it's someone who already has the baby. But what we're talking about is potentiality. Yeah, so this is the, um, the other link that's related to karma. So link number two is karmic formations. Link number 10, becoming, is kind of the nourishing and developing of that karma into its next um, developmental stage. So those two are related to karma. Yeah. And then birth is depicted by a person giving birth, um, a woman giving birth, sometimes more graphically than others. Um, in uh, Andy Weber's picture, the woman giving birth is like fully dressed and standing up and very discreet and modest. Sometimes Tibetan <laughs> painters, it's like this whole graphic like birth situation with like stuff coming out and it's all very intense. So again, it depends on the artist, but um, birth is depicted by a woman giving birth. What's important to remember is that in Buddhism, birth is actually the moment of conception. It's not the moment when the baby is coming out um, even though that's what the picture is. For us, birth, the first moment of birth is when the sperm and the egg meet and then consciousness enters. Yeah, that's birth. So then um, the sperm and the egg and the consciousness in the womb, we say is a human being. Um, and so that has any number of implications that you can sit with. Right. So then um, the second moment is aging. Right? So the baby that's like, you know, just a few cells and, you know, getting bigger and bigger, he's aging, right? That's a funny way of looking at it. But that uh, the second moment after birth is aging. And then um, death comes uh, just as a natural result. So aging and death are depicted as one link. Um, it's an old person carrying a corpse on their back. That's what the picture is. And the corpse is all kind of wrapped up in this form like, um, like Tibetans do when they wrap up a corpse to take it to the top of the hill to feed it to the vultures. Um, so if you had a Western painter, you could have them depicting it another way. But Tibetans are um, kind of unromantic about their corpses because, you know, Elvis has left the building, right? <laughs> or the consciousness has left the corpse. So now it's just a corpse. There's no need to be romantic about it. It's just meat. So might as well offer the meat to the birds. And um, yeah, it's kind of confronting, but interesting that that's the way they approach it. So that's the Outer Rings pictures. Um, so we'll go back over now each of the um, 12 links, but just the pictures themselves. Did you want to ask anything about the pictures? Uh, can you repeat about, uh, can you repeat uh, the boat one? What is the boat? The ship with the people, that's um, name and form or the five aggregates. So it's kind of like um, the boat is like form um, or the body. And then the people in the boat are the other aggregates. 
like uh, consciousness and feeling and et cetera, et cetera. If that makes okay. sense. Yep. So the people in the boat, um, name and form, um, name and form just refers to the five aggregates. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Elil or Nisam, yeah. Yeah, we have like a picture um, a different picture with 13 um, um, links. Like, so we do not understand. Um, there's uh, one more um, around the birth or um, like there's in, in, the, in the end, there's one more, but we could not understand what it is. Um, so send me a picture. Never mind. Yeah, so no, send me a picture, but I bet we probably <laughs> separated aging and death, probably, <laughs> right? Because aging and death is usually depicted as one link, but they're two words and they're two, you know, theoretically separate events. So I wonder if they just split old age and death into two, I'm guessing, but send me a picture. Yeah, probably it's that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. I don't see the third eye. Ah, uh, in the monster? Yes. Mm, yep, that picture, he doesn't have a third eye. Yeah, it depends on the painter. Thanks God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're like, I'm sure. What's wrong with my eyes? <laughs> yeah, that particular picture doesn't. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and sometimes the monster is more, even more elaborate. You know, there's three eyes and fangs and then the crowns and then there's a whole hair situation and it's, it's all very intense. Yeah, <laughs> it's all the artist. But he's always Yama, the Lord of Death, who is uncontrolled death because of karma and disturbing emotions. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Oh yeah, Ben. Hi, um, you mentioned that the, uh, the five or six senses and with the house it's empty yeah but uh, but the like in the painting the consciousness was already formed so why is it considered empty yeah it's a good question um the reason why it's considered empty is that primary mental consciousness is functioning in, at that point but the other consciousnesses the other sense consciousnesses don't have anywhere to operate through so it's um, like eye, ear, nose, tongue, etc. They need to abide in these very subtle forms and then into the organ house before they can actually do anything. Yeah, so it's like um, there's consciousness and then there's the ability for the other senses kind of like dormant or sleeping and they're like ready to be activated, but they actually can't be activated until the step of contact. Yeah, so they're like latencies. They're there, but they're not operating. Yeah, a bit like, you know, when you're sleeping, you don't usually smell stuff kind of a thing. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't mean that you can't smell anymore. It just means that that ability is like, you know, withdrawn. Yeah. Yeah, other, other questions about the outer ring? What a monster. Good. I have a question. Hi, okay. Uh, you, you said about Yama, where are the five uh, afflictions are uh, seen in the picture? Mm, yeah, Ilil is showing a picture that's got, um, I think, the crown. Usually um, uh, Yama has a crown that? with five skulls. It depends on mm. the picture, but the five skulls are not the five aggregates, but the five afflictions. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. it depends on the artist. Um, no. Okay, um, so I skipped over Buddha, which is, you know, tragic. Um, Buddha is at the top of the picture, um, pointing <laughs> to liberation. So before, before we stop for a cup of tea, we must talk about the fact that we can get out of this mess, which is why there's the Buddha there. So um, the moon represents nirvana or liberation. Um, and uh, the reason he's pointing at it is saying, Oi, <laughs> get out. Right. Here's this whole trouble down here. Everybody out. So that's what the Buddha is doing up there. Um, 
some artists um, do a really sweet thing where they put a little Buddha in every single realm in the, you know, five sections or six sections in the center. Sometimes there's a tiny Buddha in each of the realms saying, don't worry, the Buddha's not just saying get out of liberation. He's within samsara, just not controlled by samsara. He's there to benefit all sentient beings in every single realm, don't worry. So sometimes you'll see a little Buddha in all of the realms, depending on your artist. That's quite nice. Yeah. Um, other um, other questions about the twelve? What we're going to do is um, go through the intersections and um, the other um, rings, and then come back out to the big section. But I think the the important thing for us when we're looking at this picture is to remember that first of all, it came from the Buddha, um, which should say to us that uh, you're not supposed to just magically know things. Teaching tools and teaching images existed from the very beginning. Um, the other thing to remember is that it's commonly placed on the outside of temples because it's saying the reason to go into the temple is because of this mess, right? So at the doorway usually or outside or right inside in most temples, Tibetan Buddhist temples, you'll find this picture towards there rather than up on the altar. It's not usually on the altar. It's usually towards the doorway. And the reason is that it's saying the reason to enter into the gompa or enter into the temple is because this state of affairs is really problematic and we all want to get out of it. So it's like to remind you, you know, you're not going into the temple to have magical blissful experiences. You might have magical blissful experiences, but that's not the point. You know, I'm not going into the temple to be like, you know, a fancy person that goes into some exotic place. I'm not going into the temple for my own needs only, blah, blah, blah. It's just this reminder from the very outset. We enter into the gompa in order to get out of samsara. So um, keep your eyes out for that when you're doing pilgrimage. Um, it's reassuring. And the other piece to remember is that the, the point of the graphic nature of it is to kind of shock us that actually samsara is a big problem that is an unnecessary suffering. Yeah, we don't have to be out of control and we don't have to suffer as much as we do. And right now we're just like trying to make things functional. We're trying to get through the day. We're trying to soften the edges, but actually freedom is possible. And if we redirect our effort in more mind training ways, it's energy that's a lot better spent. Yeah, rather than all of our worldly ambitions, which won't really lead to anything and you know are unreliable anyway. That same energy, if we put it back into practice, will lead to something. And what's more, if you direct to the highest goal, all your little everyday worldly happinesses will get accomplished, right? But the energy doesn't end there. So if you're aiming for liberation or you're aiming for full Buddhahood, then you'll have a nice day. <laughs> if you're aiming for a nice day, then the momentum of that ends at the end of the day and you have to again, get yourself ready for a nice day. Yeah, but if you're stretching your motivation to the highest, the little stuff gets accomplished. It's like if you keep the big picture in your mind, little problems don't worry you as much. If you keep the whole spectrum of the, the, all the years you might have in front of you, all the lifetimes you have in front of you, the fact that we're having a coronavirus situation and we're stuck at home and we're worried about our parents and children, it, it's all within a context of, well, of course, it's samsara. Well, of course, what, what do we expect? And it'll finish and change and then something else will happen, won't it? And it'll just, you know, the environment will rebel and viruses will rebel and there'll be wars and there'll be famines and that's just going to keep happening because we have a samsaric mind creating a samsaric environment. This is what we should expect. Um, and rather than hit our heads against the wall saying why, 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 we can get out of it and then try and help a bit better. Yeah, so, so this is really strengthen your determination to be free. Um, th give this kind of compassion to ourselves and then in this way we can benefit others. Yeah. So we'll have a um, half, half hour break and come back.